Uh, oh, are we tweeting this out? Yeah, we're streamy right now. I'm going to go ahead and... Diamond Club? And, yeah, actually, I don't... It seems like I'm never f the first one to flip over the Diamond Club feed. Weird things. Feeling weird. All right. Check. <clears throat> check, check, check. Check, 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 check. Too much. Pulling it back. Check. One, two. Testing. One, two, three. Check a doodle. All right, let me hear you. Hello. Check. Check to check, check to check to check 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 to check, check, check your head. All right. All right. So, yeah, theoretically, we look about the same. All right. Delete. I'm going to say your stream should be up. Dot dot dot. You guys seeing it? Question mark. Oh, there it is. Before I make an A S S of myself. And pull up my little show notes. Awesome. All right. Uh, I don't know if anyone is able to move over the feed to the Diamond Club. Can anyone put us on DCTV? Question mark. Over. No. Shut your face, Justin. What's he saying? I don't know. I froze him. Oh. <laughs> like, I'm in Wait. Maui. I'm He's in like, Maui. Yeah, look at me. I'm on the other side of the world. I'm having Ma my ties and watching volcanoes. My name's Justin Robert Young. I had to get a bookshelf for all my pop-up books. Uh, oh, dude, do you have pop-up fever now? <laughs> oh, my God. That's I so have great. pop-up fever in the worst way. It's so good. No, I've got some pretty amazing ones. I got the pop-up book of sex. Oh, uh, I feel like that when the stream's over, then the stream should begin. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Other cool stuff, too. <sighs> all right. Uh, I guess. All right. So let me. <laughs> Why is Shwood live? Wow. Uh, let's do. I guess. Uh... Hey, guys. It's Brian it. Brushwood. Welcome. Shut up. Uh, bu -bu -bu wow. So my you, process. I, I, I can tell time by your hair and Chad's hair. There's like two clocks. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Uh, okay, so the way that I have to flip over the stream is I have to go to Gmail. I have to open up. I have to search for dev.diamondclub.tv for when we were using that. And then copy and paste my password. And then click on it. And then look over, type in my name, and then type in this. And then see that, and then plus, like, when I try to change the stream configuration, it's probably wrong anyway. So it's like, I, I don't really understand the tool. I go down, and I'll just do add new item, and then it just says new playlist item. No, I guess I changed the one at the top. That's what I do. I changed the one at the top of the list. This is very weird. To Brian's Daily Motion. And then, I guess... Then I have to pan down to the bottom and then hit apply. So theoretically, theoretically, hypothetically, symbolically, Diamond oh, Club Alone live. we just might be live with, or not, or maybe we have nothing. <laughs> maybe I just killed the stream and put nothing up in its stead. Hey, listen, man. I see a spinning thing. I see a pinwheel. I see. A... Oh. Ah. What was this pocket shot? Oh. Is that you or me? Um, 
Why are you blaming me, Brian? <laughs> Look, because I muted mine and then I kept hearing it. <laughs> so I was like, oh, shit. That's like a cool tripod ad. It does look like a cool ass tripod, does it not? I mean, what? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we're ready. I think we could go ahead and get started. I'm going to go ahead and tweet out that we're live now. Live now for a special edition Weird Things podcast with at Andrew Maine. And just so you know, I got a few cool things to talk about. I figured you do. Diamond Club. I had to like cut stuff out because I'm like, this is awesome, but this is more awesome. Let me just get to the the awesome, awesome. Because, you know, we can talk about anything that yeah. we have. No, well, anything weird. As long as it's weird. All right. I'm feeling it. Feeling it? I'm feeling it. And as soon as we're done here, I got to get on the line with Colleen, who has some uh, awesome ideas for uh, making some good stuff happen on the streams. Like nice. fixing, fixing things. Nice. Well, first, stop broadcasting, guys. <laughs> You're polluting the airwaves. What? Oh, to improve it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, she thinks, yeah. All it's right. a new Google initiative. It's called uh, Internet Hygiene. <laughs> it's called <laughs> We're Shut a cleansing up. kind of thing we're doing. Uh, okay, I'm 100% ready to go. I'm feeling it. All right, you you count gonna... me in, and I'll hit record. All right. Five, four. Hello, and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Mr. Brian Brushwood. And that's it. That's a hundred percent of the team that matters, dude. That's that's what counts. We got a rule: if it ain't uh, Western Hemisphere, then there's no need to fear. I just rhymed fear with fear. Also, I don't know if Hawaii is in the Eastern or Western Hemisphere. I think it might be the farthest West you can get. Yeah. Well, let's just put it this way: if you're in Maui sipping pina coladas, whatever, we don't need you on the show right now. Yeah, in fact, you're officially banned. Anyone yeah, who's you're banned, uh, who's you're in banned for one episode for the duration of which you are in Hawaii and unable to get internet access. You're off this show. That's right. But then the the moment you come back, we'll welcome you with open arms. Uh, hey, man. Besides, we don't need to go to Hawaii to have adventures. Some of no. us have adventures, harrowing adventures, right here in the good you all old good old U.S. of A. That's <laughs> which again, true. I'd like to point out that Hawaii is part of. <laughs> Brian, I don't know if you noticed, but my voice is particularly raspy today. I have noticed. I keep having to bump up your volume here. <laughs> All right. I feel like you might have had some kind of experience. I had an experience, Brian, but I don't want you to make fun of my voice. I'm not sick. I'm quite well, remarkably well. Um, this is the outcome. You know, you're like, Why, what's with the stupid raspy voice that I have to adjust the volume? Well, Brian, as you know... When one is on your knees supplicating in front of a voodoo priestess, dancing rhythmically back and forth over and over again for an extended period of time, screaming at the top of your lungs for a severed head so you can get a level one point, this is what happens. Oh my god. This right. sounds to me like you just had the most epic real-life RPG MMO. You, you either stepped into a portal to World of Warcraft or... You uh, had the overnight horror adventure that I wanted so bad to participate in. So I went to the, the great horror camp out, and uh, it's an event they do around the, uh, all around across America. They did it Friday night, Saturday night here in L.A. They're going to be in Austin. They're going to be in Oakland. And um, it was what was really cool what they did here is they set it up. It's an overnight camp out. starts at 8 p.m., and it goes to 8 a.m. in the morning. In L.A., there's the old L.A. Zoo. And if you've ever seen old movies where they have, like, zoos and, like, just the cave, the cages look like the saddest things in the world. I think it was maybe, even like, Planet of the Apes, one of the sequels or something. You see the cages and just it's shallow. Yeah. You know, you're like, and, and that's where this is. Those cages are still there. And so you have a campground there. you got those cages around the tents. And then they have all these paths and all these different things. You go off in different directions. And so, you know, you're in the middle of the night. You're in this creepy zoo. And they actually had to send everybody to the center of like the, the main area where there was a movie screen. And then one of the people told me that, yeah, we had a rattlesnake. 
and we had to Wait, make so sure so we got wait, okay all right first of all back everything up back everything up because we, because we spent like 30 minutes going over the brochure for this thing like a bunch of 12 year olds just yeah. amped up like it's a space adventure and uh, uh there was all different things i was wondering like uh, like what exactly are the rules and uh, it, it was clear that there was some kind of progression and contests uh and t uh, talent events or talent shows it was mentioned yeah so Here's like, the thing. I, I guess, I guess, can, uh, just start me off. Just, just, just give me a picture of of the first like 10, 15 minutes of orientation because they have to, th there have to be a few things they like hammer on very first thing, and that's what I'm most yeah. curious about. So, what it is is you go in there and you sit in front of like they have a stage, and that's the main area, and then you go up this path to where the tents are and the different sections for the tents, and there's other paths to different directions in the woods where there's freaky mothmen, and there's a labyrinth with chupacabra, etc. The guy who runs it, he's the uh, the the uh, head counselor. He's the guy that runs the whole thing. He's got some sort of freakish makeup on it. He's fantastic. He's just you know this presence that keeps driving the whole thing. He's like, orange tents. You've got to report to you know uh, blood tug of war. And if you don't, you're blankety expletive 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 you know i mean it's just funny kind of stuff you know just the guy his banter was really good so they're, they're not all... selling like an alternate reality this isn't like welcome to camp zombie protection you know we've got to support the front lines this is just like in a postmodernist way it just is what it is of its own accord without explanation or backstory or yeah i mean you're you're going to a summer camp that's a horror that's okay. surrounded by horrific hill people and everything else that will torment you and whatever and they're your counselors and it's yeah it's it's the thing I didn't appreciate as much was it's really a scavenger hunt. It's really a scavenger hunt. And I had a great time. I really enjoyed it. I brought a friend. She had a lot of fun. But it was such that the problem was like I'm not a scavenger hunt guy. I'm not a guy that likes to run out and chase down stuff. And one of the problems is, is like you go through, they have these corpses where you have to dig in there and grab things out of there. But there's several hundred people here. And by the time you get to them, they're picked clean. And they'll be like, oh, we're replenishing throughout the night. And you go back there two or three times, they're picked clean. So <laughs> this, is, I, uh, this is like the real life uh, uh, MMO experience. You, you yeah. walk there, you walk up and there's a bunch of people all hanging around. They're like, what's going on? You're like, we're waiting for the spawn, you know, <laughs> like, like oh, yeah. for, for new loot to appear. Oh, yeah, everybody's in, yeah, and they would do it in kind of a weird way is the way they do that, get everybody to one location, they would do that. And so they tried to make that as invisible as they could, you know. Um, people who ran it, I mean, the people, the actors and all that, really good, always in character, really committed. And there was a lot, and there's a lot of really cool fun zones and stuff. My thing was just, I didn't realize how much it was just, if you're not doing the scavenger hunt, don't go. You know, there, it's there really ain't a lot kind to of do. A, a, so so you got to be in it to play the game. And the problem with scavenger hunt is like there's like one master level prize and people people who went before they knew where to go. You know, they knew they knew how the game is played. And so you're kind of like, oh, what do we do now? And then you go there and like, oh, we're all out. And you're like, oh. Um, but that being said, it'd be fun if you have a group of people. It really, really, you know, it's fun. It just it was just a neat experience. Um, the food sucked because it was vegan food. So uh, as Woody Allen says, the portions were small and uh, they were horrible. You know, but that chili is pretty good. The chili is pretty good. But you go there at like eight o'clock and you get a little thing of chili and cornbread, and then you're like, all right, uh, that's it. But uh, okay, but there has to be. I mean, in twelve hours, is it, it? It's not just twelve hours of scavenger hunt, though. So you do. You have. You go do scavenger hunt, and then you get your tent. Your you get your you're in different zones, like your tent zone, and so you might get pulled in. Like we were in the black section, so we would get called. They like you know all blacks in tent section come to tug of war. You got to do tug of war, and then you get a bracelet. And if you get that, and again, the bracelet only plays into if you go for some master level thing. And that was my problem. There's like no other minor achievements. You, yeah, just, so you, 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 you get one thing, you get your T-shirt, and then if you want to collect everything, which is really hard, and you gotta you gotta do all things you're not supposed to, run elbow people out of the way, and do all that, you know, to get the the Hellmaster. And that there is, uh, I would imagine, because I played you know similar games and situations where it's like I felt. I felt at some level just a, a an aspect of defeat, like what's the point, a futility to yes, it. Like if I can't that, get this, then why am I bothering? Because we were like, uh, my friend Melanie and I, we're like, well, let's just have fun. And then, you know, it's kind of like you go do this because it's like, well, if you could get like, if there were intermediate kind of things you could get that were kind of cool, that would be neat. And maybe there, and it's, I felt like it wasn't quite as explained to me as it could have been. And the map was not very helpful. We almost missed entire sections there again. You know, it's they they put overall put on an amazing thing, but you just kind of going like, man, how would this be better? How, how would this be? Better? How many how many people were there? Do you think total? I mean, two or three hundred. Okay, 
Yeah. So two but or three hundred, yeah. and and the, the the focus was the scavenger hunt. But there's also talk about like grabbing people out of tents and stuff. Did any of that yeah, happen? Yeah. So they do it, you know, the middle of the night, like after like you're at two thirty, like all right, time for bed, and then you're in the middle of the night, like four thirty in the morning. You know, hillbillies come will come and try and drag you out of your tent. And then uh, I mean, could you kick him away and say, "No, sir, I would rather sleep." <laughs> yeah, you could try. You're not allowed to touch them, but you can. Like I had, they came where they ripped open our tent and they tried grabbing stuff, and I just pulled the stuff back, and then they left. But what's funny is I knew you knew when something was about to happen because they were taping this with a quadcopter, and you'd hear the <laughs> and like four thirty in the morning, I hear <laughs> I'm like quadcopters. They're taping something. So okay, get ready. Real quick, real quick. Do you realize if we time traveled twenty two years ago and uh, and freaking like you had just come out of Terminator two, and and you're like, well, in the future. Future, it won't be like this, but it'll be close enough that that you and I will have unironically a conversation in which you say, "Well, you always knew when the soldiers were coming because you'd hear the <laughs> drones approach first. I mean, yeah. it's like how yeah. amazing is the fact that, that we live in this world, and how great is it that we pay for a weekend retreat instead of being enslaved by the robots? True that. Well, we'll get into that a little bit later. So now, I I think if you like horror stuff, do it by all means. Do it and be prepared for scavenger hunt. Be have your game face on, and you will really. I'm a guy like I just like to walk around and explore and have people go boo, you know. So so you'd like it better if it, uh, you know, that's one. One thing that uh, I think um, uh, Universal Halloween Horror Nights always did really well was that there was always multiple levels. If you wanted yeah. to do, uh, uh, oh, I'm hearing a little bit of myself echo. Uh, if you wanted to do haunted houses, there was a ton of them there. If you wanted to just hang out, they had like safe areas and scare areas, and uh, and of course there was the rides and stuff. This yeah, they, this one they, was very more had like one I mean, main they, track. They, they have like a very like hey sit around and watch movies and do arts and crafts sort of track. Yeah, but it's like it's sort of thing like there could be a kind of an intermediary, you know. And again, they evolve this thing over every year. A lot of thought goes in this. Again, I don't mean I'm, I'm just you know, my own little not being a scavenger hunt guy. My thing. I think it's it was a great experience. I highly recommend anybody go see it. You know. All right. So explain to us the scene that you opened everything with, with you holding a severed head and worshiping so, for a point. Go up this dark path, and we, in order to get in there, we had to have like. Uh, like find a candle or something. We go up this. No, we had, we had go up this dark path, and there are people dressed like they're about you know doing a voodoo ceremony, and they wait and wait. And they tell you to go away, like go away, go away. But you stick around, and finally, some guy starts beating the drums, and then a bunch of like voodoo dancers come out there and start doing like you know ensemble voodoo dance, and you're supposed to participate. And they, you know, they, you know, they'll pull point to one, you know, whoever's really into it, they pointed to one girl and they're like, all right, take your shirt off, you know, so she takes off her shirt. You're like, all right, get on the ground, bark like a dog, you know, and she barks like a dog, you know, like, and do that, you know, they make her do all these very denigrating things. And then they pull out this severed head, which is the prize, like, make out with the head, you know, so she makes out with the head, da da da. da. Oh and my then God. Go, like, they, they pointed to me and they're like, you step forward, and a couple other guys. And then I'm like, all right. I'm, I'm, if I'm gonna, if I'm this far, I'm gonna, I, we were, I was like the first person there with my friend and I'm like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go all the way. Go so all in. next thing you're like on your knees, on my knees, you know, it's bark like we're all barking like dogs. And like all the other guys are, so I'm elbowing my way through, going to the front of the line, doing everything I'm supposed to do, bark, scream, jump, whatever. They will pull out the head and like, make out that. I made out with the head. <laughs> I, I, I suck face with that fake head. Like, you know, there was no tomorrow. I'll, I'll tell you what, there's, there's something and and no matter how. Uh, no matter how constructed, oh my God, you look great. <laughs> no matter how constructed this scenario is that you have going into it, there is something about the power of ritual that is utterly hypnotic. You know, I did um, 20 years ago, I did a uh, uh, mystery school with Jeff McBride, right? You get, uh -huh. uh, you know, Eugene Berger telling ghost stories, and, you know, uh, it's where I meet uh, Christian Shellman and a few other folks. Uh, it's where I met Kevin James and. Uh, um, uh, Dan Harlan, and you know, there's there's a, there's a heavy emphasis on ritual and drum beating and masks and like there's a, some creepy like like hive mind stuff that just sort mm -hmm. of takes over and it doesn't matter that this guy's a PhD in linguistics over here and this guy's a you know talented sleight of hand person, something takes over and I totally see how in, especially in tribal times, that kind of ecstatic experience in a place where you know beer might be in short supply would be the number one mind-altering experience of choice. Yeah, I mean, there's that. And then also, like, the competitive, like, things I don't like scavenger hunts, because once I get competitive, I get vicious. Yeah. And I don't <laughs> like that. Because, like, once I'm, like, committed to that, I'm like, I'm going to win this. I'm going to elbow people out of the way. I'm going to push through there. I'm going to do whatever I can. And I got the head. I won, you know? And it was just, and I'm like, I don't want to be, I, I won't have as much fun if I'm doing that, though. 
So. Yeah. So, so if for you, if, if the experience, if there was a track where you could say, I want to experience all of this, I don't want it to be a competition for me though. You would have taken that track. Yeah. If it were more like, Hey, you know, get this, get a merit badge, do this, do a merit badge kind of thing. That would, for me, that would be more fun, I think. Yeah. But now was there somebody else there who are, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, um, freaking, uh, uh, lifers, you know, people who, uh. Yeah, there are people I ran into a couple of friends, uh, one friend who had been the year before. And so you go people like because I think this is the second year it's in L.A. And, and that's the thing is like these people know what to do. And so like your first year, it's like it's going to be hard as heck to, you know, to get the, the high thing because like, you know, to get that head was really, really hard. And you have to get like three things like that. And, you know, then they had some other thing where they're like, oh, tell us your darkest secret. And some guy next to me goes, I like Justin Bieber. And they're like, you win. And you're like, really? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like I spent 20 minutes screaming to the top of my lungs for this severed head. Yeah. I made out with this severed head. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then there's some guy makes a joke and he gets it. So it's like, anyhow, Brian, enough of that. What? If you want to check out Great Horror Campout, greathorrorcampout.com. Check out if it's coming to a place near you. Um. Brian, we got a lot of stuff to talk about here. Uh, what, do we? Are you saying that a bunch of weird things happened this week? Brian, a lot of weird things name, happened. Okay, name first, one weird thing, sir. Well, cool thing coming up. Uh, I never, I don't know how to pronounce, but remember the Antikythera, Antikythera, the ancient computer they found in the Roman shipwreck that had the Greek symbols on it. They believe was made for calculating the orbits of you know the planets and lunar events and possibly tides i i actually don't remember this but i'm looking at an antikythera mechanism on wikipedia uh oh, wow. th this is the thing right here right yeah so they found this in a shipwreck on like 1900 sponge divers or whatever found it and it was this rusted thing and for the longest time nobody realized what it was till they x-rayed and they looked inside and there were gears and all sorts of other mechanical devices and this was uh, you know in some ways it was considered you know one of these things that it was an impossibility given what we knew at the time. It's a thousand years before anything else like that. Maybe not until the 1300s. Okay, so so this this was found in you said the 1900s. Is that right? Yeah, like 1901 or okay, 1906. and and it dates back thousands of years. And I swear, if you looked at this uh, for those you know not seeing us live, uh, it looks like a gear mechanism straight out of. I mean, to be honest, like I'm I'm playing uh, uh, the new Wolfenstein game. It seems like something that. Would be right at home in there. Lots of gears and, yeah. and tumblers. We we didn't. If you the historical record, we didn't. We weren't making things like this until the 1300s. You know, started to make complex clockwork, and uh, you know, and really good by the way, spring mechanisms, which this does not have to my knowledge, didn't exist until like, I think the 1700s or 1600s or 1700s. But anyhow, um, it's it was 1400 years before we expected something like this and then we there are a lot of things or passages in ancient texts and stuff like if you went to like you know the roads you know the city of Rhodes, you would hear about they said there were mechanical statues that would move at every street corner and there's a lot of accounts of these mechanical things and i believe that these things were very much real and you had people craftsmen who would make these things for kings or rich people but the problem was is that they would break down after the guy who made it was done and you would just you know they're they're not around anymore because they'd break down. You pull them out of the palace wherever it was. You'd go for the parts, and then these things were exceedingly rare to begin with. But there are a lot of accounts of really interesting devices. But anyhow, this mechanism is fan is fascinating, and we're just we've been able to make what we think are reconstructions of it, and it and it shows that the Greeks had a much more command of mechanical devices than we realized. What's interesting about this is they found what they think may have been one or two extra parts, which suggests that there might be another mechanism. And so now there's an expedition using one of these hard shell diving suits to go back down to the ship to go look for another one of these. Man, that's like straight out of an episode of G.I. Joe, where it's like, yeah. you know, it's like like the first season ends and they're like, uh, they're like, you know, we believe we found parts to you know, it's it, it, more powerful twin. And now, like, we got to go before Cobra to get all the pieces to construct it. Well, and but and this is what I'm saying. So, like, if this this object, if we hadn't seen this object right now, and if the Sun Sponge Diners hadn't happened upon this one wreck, this one little piece, this entire history of mechanical capabilities would be unknown to us. We'd have no idea about this. And we'd be sitting here thinking, like, yeah, and, then, and nothing like that existed until the 1400s. You know, and Who that's what else is down there. Uh, I mean, first of all, I do I do wonder what else is down there, but uh, but it's so fascinating to me the way 
we have I, I don't want to say that we worship the present or whatever, but we just we just assume that everyone was dumb 20 minutes ago and that nobody could do anything like we, we saw this with uh, there. You know, there were uh, tribes that uh, that were able to recognize that uh, Sirius is a binary star or whatever, and uh, uh, which I, I think I'm getting the wrong star, whatever. Uh, and they're like, well, clearly they couldn't have known because of the, they, they, they didn't have any optics and they wouldn't have any trade. And then it's only later they're like, well, no, they had a robust trade and there were, you know, Westerners coming down in the 1600s who would be able to explain this stuff and maps and so on. And then it's like, uh, OK, well, uh, them pyramids are real big and they were dumb back then. So they couldn't have made the pyramids. Must have been space aliens. And then and now we're starting to see it with stuff just 60 years ago where it's like. Yeah, yeah, what? We didn't have computers. Computers were dumb back then. We couldn't go to the moon. When, when meanwhile, the fundamentals of gears and mechanics, the fundamentals of Newtonian physics, the fundamentals of, you know, of, of, of astronomy uh, haven't changed. And, and those people had a lot. The smart people back in the day had a lot of time on their hands mm -hmm. to do this stuff. So I don't, I don't understand what the appeal is, what the draw is that caused us all to marvel and believe that it's not possible for our grandparents to have done anything scientifically impressive. Yeah, I, I, I'll, oh, I'll blow your mind with something really cool. All I, right. I didn't tell you about this, all right? And this was sort of a, I apologize, because this is a little of a, uh, uh, for those of you guys just tuning in, Andrew is doing so a I've summoning doing chant. I've been doing some research, Brian, on for another project I'm writing, and this was this is sort of really just peripherally related to it, not at all. But I found this doing a little Google search. Do you know the difference between a dirigible and a blimp? Uh, I believe, forgive me if I'm wrong here. I believe that a dirigible or a zeppelin has hard sides, and a blimp, uh, like there's a scaffolding, a framework in a dirigible, but but a blimp is just an inflated balloon. Yes, sir. Like dirigible, they're rigid. They're rigid you know, the rigid yeah. part of it. So, you know, the 1920s and 30s were interesting because I've been doing a lot of research on like airships, you know, things like that. And, you know, the size of these things, I think we've mentioned before, or, you know, we had like the USS Akron, which carried like 90 people, could have carried 250,000 pounds of cargo, was a thousand feet long. And this was in our Navy. We had actual airships in our Navy. I found out about another airship. I had no idea, didn't even know this was possible. We had a thing called the ZMC-2, ZMC-2, okay? And this is when you say we, you're talking about the United States. United States Navy it was a they contract to have this thing built. The ZMC was built in 1929. It was scrapped in 1941, and by scrapped we mean this. It was a solid metal airship. Uh, uh, well, I mean, it was the inside was filled with you know helium, Brian. Well, of but, course, yeah, no, it wasn't. It wasn't a floating lead ingot. It was. <laughs> but uh, all right, I'm looking at it. I'm looking at a picture of it here. Uh, it looks just like the freaking Goodyear blimp, but it's it's or it looks like Fat Man or Little Boy or a giant bomb because it's mat. That's a completely metal exterior, and it's uh, made of this uh, this aluminum alloy. And the if you look at construction photos of this thing when they're building it, it's amazing because you see this thing is basically like they have half of it that that top you know the front half of it's on its the nose cones pointing up. There you go. If you scroll down there, you might see some photos of this thing. So this was a solid metal thing. Now, okay. Now, okay. So this does that mean that there was no scaffolding on the inside? No, there was a scaffolding, or? the same as an airplane has. Okay. 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 But it was surrounded. God, that's astonishing. Do they weld it shut to keep it they airtight? Used, they riveted. They riveted the thing shut. Are you kidding me? Okay, this thing is riveted shut, and in fact, what was fascinating about it is that they said that it had a higher, uh, it was able to hold its helium much longer than other forms a of... A better seal than a balloon. Yep. Riveted because, shut. Yep. Yeah. Uh, okay, so so is the thinking, is the motivation, like, I guess they just, number one, obviously, if it held its helium longer, then riveting certainly worked. Uh, number two, I, I would guess that like, could, could it withstand being shot or anything? Um, I think that they were looking for, I, I, to be honest with you, I don't know what the full rationale was, but I think that they were looking at that point, you know, the evolution of where these things would go to and to move from something that was fabric and could rip to something metal and, you know, would be much more puncture resistant. 
It just uh, seems like the like I guess I could see a world where that would just be the more civilized thing to do, right? You know, you don't you don't you don't go to war with with fabric that could be torn. You go to war with, boy, this is astonishing. Uh, there, there's a decent enough close up here, uh, and all you have to do is search for ZMC dash two. Uh, one of these close ups, you can see all the individual panels that each look like they're maybe three feet wide and. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to send you this website I'm sending it to you now actually has photos of the construction of it. Okay. And you can see when the upright cone is being, and you just appreciate the fact that it's not just, it's not like it's aluminum foil stretched across a frame. Oh, dude, this thing is like standing erect uh, yes. uh, vertically. Like uh, it looks like a rocket, to be honest. Yeah. So, so it's like it's, once you set your mind, like picture a missile, but then picture pointing to a missile pointing up to the sky and saying, yeah, by the way, that's filled with uh, helium and has a better seal <laughs> than, than a and, balloon. And, and, you know, and people might look at that and go, well, you know, remember how thick or thin the lunar lander was? You know, they're afraid the astronauts would kick it and kick through the metal. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's a good point. So, but the, so this was a solid metal thing. I mean, amazing. I didn't know that it was, that it was, you know, light enough they're able to do it and you know there was some question of you know how fast it would be it turned out it was a lot faster than they realized and you know there was you know building it was interesting because part of the problem air, uh, helium and air mixes really well together and when you wanted to you have this big giant thing where normally a balloon you just fill the bag up like that right we're here you had this solid chamber and so oh you like, needed to get one out and the yeah. other one in. So what they said was, all right, well, let's fill it with carbon dioxide, which is a lot easier to, because we'll put the helium through the top and the carbon dioxide comes out to the bottom. And so they're about to do this. And somebody's like, oh, wait a second. Carbon dioxide is going to weigh several tons more than the helium. It won't be we able to, to support the weight. Yeah, we got to build a scaffold on the outside so this thing doesn't topple over. But anyhow, as you're saying, like, you know, we only built, we've only built one of these. We built one of these in 1929, okay? We built a metal airship a metal airship a metal lighter than air metal airship solid metal from head to toe and we've never built one since so picture okay looking at it now and to get a sense of scale this thing's what the the length of a football field would it be safe yeah, it's, to say? not, it's i mean it's it was actually like 140 feet long or something so it's 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 and it's it's remarkably compact 150 feet long okay and so we're picturing these panels being uh you think they're what like maybe a millimeter or less thick you know, kind of like yeah, they were like they were pretty thin for everything. Yeah, so 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 picture it, like looking at it now. If I picture it made of soda can material, I can buy it. I mean, not that not that not. I mean, look, I don't I don't doubt it, but uh -huh. I'm just saying like to wrap my mind around how that's yeah. possible. I can yeah. I can wrap I can get in there. And and I and I'll bring this up because you know there is a uh, like Wired Mag Wired online. I love Wired. They've got a lot of great articles there. I really Wired's one of my favorite places for long form journalism. But they have like this habit every now and then. Like I think it was Wired or Io9. Like let's deconstruct the Shield helicarrier and like why it's impossible. And they're like, well, assuming that it's built like a battleship. Well, no. Yeah. Why are you assuming that? Yeah. And and I was frustrated. To read this because it's like, why don't you start with our actual history of lighter than airships employed in the military like our dirigibles we used in the 1920s that could carry quarter million pounds and had 90 people on board and airplanes could land could hook up to and detach from yeah well i mean at the end of the day you got some blogger who's being paid to make 20 articles a day and but it's far more interesting to me to go well wait a second you know what like if we took we follow the path of this all metal airship to its conclusion and say we still had large spaces that we had to put helium inside of whatever maybe we could have built you know and you, you could have built an aircraft carrier out of this you yeah. could have put runway on top of it you could have done that yes you could have done all those i don't know that you'd be able to support you know like harrier jets on it in when it's in the sea well remember that the, 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 the and as i mentioned before the the uss akron which we used it actually had planes hook up it could carry a quarter million pounds worth of cargo wow the problem is like, you, but yeah, there's stability issues. It's, you know, they're sitting targets. Wait, oh my God. Yeah. So wait, you, you are talking about another dirigible, a quarter million pounds in the freaking sky. Yeah. That's amazing. This, there was a point when you could go into the Navy and you could serve aboard a flying aircraft carrier. That's pretty dope. Yeah. Okay, an aircraft carrier that, or yeah, I guess an aircraft carrying aircraft.
Now, I was just in New York, and I went on the USS Intrepid, which is the uh, the aircraft carrier up there that served in World War II. Mm-hmm. That's like a thousand feet long. The USS Akron was seven hundred eighty-five feet long. Really, and, like and almost it had, as long. had the same, roughly the same width across. So this is the thing: the size of an aircraft carrier. That's so awesome. Uh, now it says wreckage. Did the Akron go down? Yeah, severe weather. That's the problem with these things. Is that- <laughs> <laughs> we get real excited. We're like, yeah, let's go for it. Uh, well, there's problems. We, you get a little bit of a wind. And, you know, they're, 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 they, were, they were an exciting idea, and then aircraft just developed so much more at a faster pace to the point that you put one of these things up there, then short of like you know, send them over England and try to bomb them, um, they weren't going to be as practical because – the vent, you know, you put one guy in a biplane, gets close enough, you could take it down. Yeah, and I'm guessing uh, that uh, while well, probably not a quarter million pounds, my guess is that the payload of like a you know an Airbus seven or whatever Dreamliner seven 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 or whatever would probably be impressive as well. Yeah, maybe I'm sure. So, but anyhow, it's a just it's a, it was you think about the future from that point of view as we talk about like in the 1920s when you were thinking these things were real. Oh. Yeah, like like not uh, uh, nowadays they're they're hel- I don't know we look at them as hilarious uh, anachronistic uh, constructs. Again, I'm I'm going back to some of the some of the beautiful design in in Wolfenstein, but uh, but man, for that to just be science fact as they put uh-huh. it, it's pretty amazing. So just the question somebody asked is a valid one. What are the practical things other than dropping bombs? Well, like the Akron, they would thought about you could do aircraft support. Cargo delivery. There were the ideas that you could deliver, you know, deliver troops across enemy lines, and and this was a point before aircraft. You know, in the 1930s, we started building. You know, the Curtis Air Company started building bigger aircraft, but we were still trying to figure out what was the shape of the future going to be. Mm-hmm. And then, in retrospect, we look at how large airplanes became, how relatively reliable they became, and it's easy to understand that. But at that point, we didn't know. But then, when after a number of these things, between the Hindenburg, between a lot of these things crashing, we realized these things are they're not. It's the going up and down is kind of a problem because they're very susceptible to weather. Well, and what's weird is the ways that we're revisiting those uh, those ideas where we have like the uh, I don't know the Google Loon is that what it is the uh, mm-hmm. uh, the the plan to have uh, uh, permanent floating took, already structures. already took out the power in a neighborhood when one of them crashed into a power lines. Did it really? Oh. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Don't be hating on the balloons. Yeah. No, and I think we're an exciting point now. There are companies that want to build now what we have. with This was built in 1920s technology. This was pre-composites, pre-plastics really effectively. And, and the materials we have now, who knows? Don't be afraid to dream big. So speaking of amazing things, Brian. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, we try not to mention it every episode unless there's something really cool going on. I'm, I'm already gonna. Uh, let's see. S P A C E. Yeah. Now we had we had two really cool, you know, product announcements in the last couple of weeks. One for like developers, the Apple thing, which was kind of exciting to see where that was going. If you're into that, but before that, I mean, like, I think the best best product announcement I have seen in my entire life. And again, I'm I'm a devoted Steve Jobs fan, but I think it was Elon Musk SpaceX because when you can do a product unveiling where it ends where you step into your spaceship and sit in the captain's chair, dude. Uh, okay, so this and and you're right. I I I guess I forgot that that was this week that this happened. The the Dragon V2 unveiling event was number one. Like it was like E3. It felt like so ultimately over the top, so freaking Iron Man. Uh, I I adored it, and it was amazing because shortly after this announcement, uh, I started getting emails from everybody peripherally involved on it saying stuff like, for example, NVIDIA says, like, by the way, NVIDIA uh, graphics technology in space, and uh, (laughs) it it was really great. Yeah, it's like I get the Google News alerts, and so whenever, like, you'll hear, like, such and such, which is work with SpaceX on this. Um, and so those of you who don't know, Elon Musk of SpaceX, they unveiled their next generation capsule to go on top of their Falcon spacecraft. And this is for part of the part of the funding came from NASA for their crew delivery program. It is called the Dragon 2, and it can carry seven people into space to the International Space Station and then back down. But you're like, hey, guys, um, we've been doing that since a guy named Yuri Gagarin. Oh, but here's the difference. It's like, and it's like, I don't know. You almost picture it saying like, "Oh, let me guess, uh, pureed uh, peas, uh, freaking, uh, uh, was it uh, astronaut lunches with uh, freeze dried ice creams? Boring." 
Let's take it to the next ge level, gentlemen. How so, like, oh, I was gonna say, how far into this do they drop the curtain? I want to, I want to actually see. Yeah, it's only thirteen minutes long to watch it, so it's worth it. But so, what, what, what makes this special? It's the Dragon Two special. Again, this is a thing they're beginning, ready to begin testing now. The thing on stage is not like supposed to be some mock-up. It's supposed to be an actual thing. It can land without a parachute. It uses retro rockets to go from Earth orbit back down to the Earth. It's a freaking spaceship. The spaceship. And and when you see it inside, now when you look on the outside, you're like, well, that looks like the top of a missile. Just like, uh, didn't you just show ah, us that made in the 1920s? Sexy, the way those rocket engines are folded under there, kind of cool. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm a little yeah, aroused, Brian. A a fully functional rocket that he shows. And once you go inside, man, it's unreal. So they explain the mechanics of of getting up and payloads and and that stuff. But then when you come home, come home. Look at that. Not when you, when you come back to your planet. Uh, yeah. And by the way, that in, one of the things that they've said about this is it can land on any hard surface in the solar system. God, that's so great. This this whole this whole like like this is it's re it's happening. It's really happening. Yeah. So you're we're seeing a mock up right now. A little yeah. uh, you know it's computer generated, sure. But uh, but basically when it comes down, it has that brief moment of uh, you know the shuttlecock kind of. Uh, Everything getting white hot because fire comes at you when you're in space. And then it starts firing the rockets and it basically just skids its way slower and slower. I can't believe that there's enough fuel to slow it all the way down inside that little, that little, it just doesn't seem like there should be enough fuel to slow that thing. Uh, yeah, well, that was the debate, you know, <laughs> that and that's what uh, SpaceX has been spending the last decade trying to figure out. And what's really cool is when he watches this video, the uh, foreground is framed because suspended from the feeling, ceiling is the first dragon capsule to go up and come back down. And what's significant about that right now is other than, to my knowledge, other than when we use the, uh, the, the Soviet hardware, all the other companies that have stuff, they're not, they don't come back down. They, you know, they incinerate back when they go into the Earth's atmosphere because short of the shuttle and, uh... Well, and that's the, uh, and, and even then, it's, it's, it's debatable. It's, it's up for argument just how reusable uh, the shuttle well, I was. Why it's reusable? I mean, I mean, no, I don't say reusable. Right. I'm saying, no, everything else burns up, doesn't come back down. Right, right. What we're doing, we go, resupply all the things we send resupply right now to the ISS, other than... Other than uh, the the Russian, you know, the Soviet era, but the Russian designed capsules, um, all the other private ones, all the other countries, there's they they deliver their cargo, then they burn up in the atmosphere. They don't come back down, and so the Dragon, the Dragon, the first Dragon was able to do that, and now this Dragon. And I guess I guess we're going in stages here too, where it's like uh, this. Obviously, of everything you want to be able to deliver and bring back, hopefully in reusable format, the the crew module would be would be the biggest one but but the uh, fact that this is all part of a long game and they fully intend to have all three stages just have a happy jaunt back to earth and all of a sudden we're just refueling uh dude how'd you like to be those guys your job yeah. is to whip out the the, <laughs> the uh, stairs for elon musk to step into his spaceship <laughs> and, it, and i'll tell you what's interesting too, is you look at this thing on one hand you can forget the sense of scale but then you watch you know, as Musk walks up the stairs to his spaceship to climb inside. Look at this thing! This thing <laughs> is amazing! And, and and there's so much free space. That's what I don't understand. And and part of it, I'm sure, is that it's a very wide-angle lens yeah. in there. You can see he seems to grow gigantically. But they've got these, instead of these giant padded seats, like, instead it looks, to be honest, of everything I've seen in science fiction, this looks closest to the interior of the pod in uh, in uh, 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 what was the Sagan movie uh, Contact? Yeah, but uh, I think these chairs are mounted better. Um, yeah, look at this. <laughs> he's got this pull down display. You know, it it, it feels uh, an awful lot like if you've ever ridden the Mission to Mars uh, experience at at Disney. Like the whole like you sit in and it leans back and then you pull the console down to you, and it's got all the graphics. Like if I saw these graphics in a modern science fiction movie, I would be slightly annoyed because it would look like that's so fake. That's not that's not how they build spaceships. Where they get those seats, Tesla? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, it's just amazing. I highly recommend watching all of it. And the walkthrough is astonishing. And of course, all the numbers. I, I, unfortunately, haven't you heard, Andrew? There's the odds of us making it to Mars in the next 86 years are virtually nil. Oh, so there's like, I think the National Science Academy released this paper talking about like, if we want to go to Mars, 
we're going to have to partner with somebody because there's no way we'd be able to afford to be able to do it, which was like within like, you know, by the end of the century. And I said, I think of Brian, I'm like, that's like somebody in the Lincoln administration saying that, you know, it'll be 1969 before we make it to the moon. Yes. You know, it's like it makes no sense at all, you know, for us to be, you know, for anybody to be anybody who thinks they can make some sort of prediction that far out has no business making predictions. Yeah. Yeah, and there, could be, and there could be. I mean, we may not. I mean, there could be all sorts of things that come into play. But this, this, the idea that oh no, we won't have the capability. Well, and that's the problem is is when you get in the business, it's it's a bad business to be in. Uh, the business of saying what mankind is not going to be able to do, and yeah. uh, it's it's littered with the hilarious uh, corpses of one-liners from history's greatest yeah. minds. And and you know I'm. I'm, you know, one of the things I bristle at, and I, that's when I when I went into the thing about the whole we could not have faked the moon landing in 1969 video because, you know, to my opinion, you know, the arguments that he made for why we couldn't have were specious, like oh we didn't have film canisters that were this big, and then, like Andy Warhol was using 33 minute film canisters, but he didn't mention that, you know, and there's right. things like that are like it was just like yeah we went to the moon, absolutely went to the moon, but let's not make bogus art and let's not say we couldn't have done this thing or we can't do this thing because. They're smarter people out there. But let's not essentially make the exact same mistake that people that moon deniers are doing, which is basically exactly. which is basically what we were talking about just two segments ago, which was uh, oh back then people be dumb they couldn't have done it, you know. And yeah. uh, it's a bad argument no matter which side that uh, that you make it on. Yeah, I mean you you look at the available evidence and you can say if a thing you know it's hard to you can't prove a negative essentially. Um, and you have to look at the evidence, but to say what can't be done or won't be done is just based in the future is not the past. It's not a bigger version of the past. Yeah. So speaking of things that are supposed to not be able to get done, there has been a big shakeup that came out today, Brian. Uh, oh, man, that was today. I can't believe how fast things are changing. Or yesterday, but yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it was announced. Um, now... We've talked about the Turing test before. Uh, Alan Turing came up with this idea, and, and it basically kind of tes- t- went on, uh, took off on a philosophical idea that if we were to create an artificially intelligent computer or system, how do we know if it's conscious or not? And he, he touched upon a very important philosophical argument. How do I know that anybody else is conscious? Yeah, I and, don't. And, and keep in mind, there's two layers to it. If you're not familiar with Turing's amazing story, uh, he eventually predicted the rise of, of machines. Never actually, he, he, he synthesized the entire concept of artificial computing, the way it exists to this day, with the hypothetical idea of a, a print head that could write zeros and ones and read it. And, and an infinitely long piece of tape. And from that, he figured out, well, okay, so computers are going to be a thing, and I'll bet somebody could write a routine that would simulate a person. How would you figure out the difference between a person and a computer? And then to hit that next level, like you mentioned, Andrew, of saying, well, how do I know anyone else is? And to come up with such a practical, and it's not a perfect thing. It doesn't say, it doesn't prove that anything has a soul or anything like that. He says, uh you know the the test is 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 if all things being equal you can't tell the difference between a artificial intelligence and an actual intelligence then for all intents and purposes it's as that's as real intelligence as you can ever prove because beyond that like you said you can't prove that anyone else has intelligence exactly and that, and that's what gets to the heart of it people will come up with like well we know this about like you know we can we can talk about how we think internally and we can co- dissect somebody else and do that but end of the day is what we regard as consciousness is the expression of how things are sort of done. Because I can't know your inner monologue. I can't know what's really going on there within reason. And so the idea is the fairest way is to say if it fools you into thinking that it's human, then you might as well say I give it the potential that it's conscious. Yeah. You know, and consciousness is one of these, you know, there's still these big mysteries, you know, I think we'll be building really intelligent conscious machines and still not understanding how it works. Well, and uh, so why are we talking about it today? Well, we're talking about it today because, Brian, they do periodically there have been tests where they actually have computers try to pass the Turing test. And the, the essential idea that he described it is you would ask somebody questions and you would ask, you know, through some sort of intermediary that would maybe transcribe them or whatever. And you'd ask questions and I'd have, have an opportunity to keep asking questions. And then at the end of that, I have to decide if I'm talking to a human or not. And one of the ways that it was described, if you would have, let's say, more than 30% of the people were convinced that you were human, then effectively it passed the Turing test. It fooled 
30 percent of people into thinking that this was human well and in a perfect turing test it would be a completely unrestricted voice-based conversation with some either you know through a screen looking at what you think is the face of another person or whatever you could decide just how perfect perfect is for it to be and historically they've when they've had these competitions they've had to do things like limit the um the the scope of the conversation we're like well you need to just talk about rocketry that's the only thing you're allowed to talk about and uh and you know there were tricks people could do to make things feel more human for example insult you randomly or or say they're not interested in that or challenge you uh all these things that essentially they were baking in surprises uh but but nobody has ever just full on full on fooled uh and you know and, and again even the 30 percent people or whatever is kind of an arbitrary line to cross but can you tell me was this totally unrestricted or was it was it based on a certain thing or was he was he up against 13 year olds because this was allegedly eugene Gustman, a 13 year old boy so the uh the way the test was done is they had a, a mixture of panel of people who were doing the evaluations and one of which was actually Crichton, the guy who played Crichton in red dwarf which was kind of amusing and so and that's going to be the next thing is people are going to qualify and say, well, are the people who are doing the judging valid or whatever? Because we've we've had just a side note. There have been like uh, there have been chat bots like Eliza, I think, was one that you can put into chat rooms and people will carry on conversations. Certain kinds of people will carry on conversations with them and never realize they're talking to a robot. And I think it's and it's a way to, to you know, diagnose extremely narcissistic people, I think. But we've had we have things that can fool people who aren't really credible at telling this. So that will be the next question: is like, what should the mixture of the panel be, et cetera? But um, you know, it's it's pretty much the first solid test by an institution that thinks that this is the University of Reading says you know it's this is they they, they think that there are other places have tried to do tests before, but they say they think theirs is the fairest, more accurate thing to do. And this computer came program came close back in like 2012 of passing. And effectively, in what it's able to do is one of the questions you want to ask. You would you know, historically you'd ask. You'd say, "Hey, uh, you know, I have a my pet. You know, I have a pet dog. His name is Joe. Um, you know, uh, can you name what pets I may have? You know." So, like a and, logic, a logical conundrum where anyone yeah. who actually truly was understanding you would understand the different elements and piece together what you're asking. Yeah, and things that the simple context, just a very simple context change. You know, I have a pet named Joe. Could you tell me the name of my dog? You know, and then you'd have to go, oh, pet means dog, da 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 da, da back and forth, and things that we just take for granted and a six year old could do. Yeah. And so a lot of times they would trump. They'd go, oh, and they would have clever ways of outs of like, oh, pets are fun. I love pets, da da da. What's the name? Uh, you know, what's the name of my dog? Like, what's the name of your dog? Well, whatever you want to call it, you right. know? And, yeah, and, or, or, or I don't know, what's the name of my dog? And so you can make, you can very easily make programs like that that give these pat flip response like Eliza would do and just turn it back like, no, tell me about you. You know, that's one of the things that works. And you could pass, you know, you could certain people would be fall for it. They wouldn't realize there'd be, there's an evasion there. Here, you know, one of the questions was like, uh, you know, my car is red, you know, what kind of car, what color would you, you know, is the car in my driveway? Oh, it's red. You know, he would answer you, tell you these things, these very simple things connecting those statements. So here's what's astonishing to me. This quote here, uh, Kevin Warwick says that, uh, that a computer that can think and act like a person will be an asset to battling cybercrime. Quote, online real-time communication of this type can influence an individual human in such a way that they are fooled into believing something is true when it, in fact it is not. Understand like a big way that they battle cybercrime is by having undercover agents uh, be uh, hackers and hang out with hackers in IRC chat rooms and uh, uh, you know to talk about and participate in you know whatever different shenanigans that they're up to. Uh, and there are things that hacking groups use to test whether or not people are cops. You know to uh, that work sometimes and 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 don't work. But it really does change the balance of power when there is no resource limitation. You have unlimited mind. Uh, mind power of, of, of an army of 13 year olds who can all talk and gather information and remember, well, this guy from this IP address at this point said his was so-and-so and that he was connected to so-and-so like this ability to 
co collect massive amounts of data that could not ever have been just mass processed by a computer before. This kind of parsing and, and hands-on undercover work, basically, is an extraordinary thought. You know, yeah, and it's, it's I think that we're going to see both sides of that. I, you know, you give in, you know, you look at the complexity now of certain kinds of, uh, scams too and you have like the phone things too like hey let me speak to brian hey this is brian hey brian i want to tell you about a new offer and you don't know if it's they have ones where they have one operator sending responses to like 15 people at a time and so it's certainly going to make you know the scammers are going to use this too and people trying to sell you stuff and you're gonna you're gonna have you know you're gonna be a lot easier to make very personalized scam emails. Oh my so God. Think Would you realize like already there are, and we've talked about this on the show. I, I already get a number of, of, of robot. I, I, call, I guess I say they're robots, but they're not really robots. I pick up the phone and, and it sounds like a telemarketer yeah. saying like, hi, I'm so-and-so I wanted to tell you about whatever. And then you'll, and then you'll ask like, wait, are you a robot? And they'll, and they'll always, the, it's the same thing. They go, ha do I really sound that bad? And you're like, Oh no, I guess you sound okay. And then they'll, and then they'll say, uh, they'll They'll say, well, anyway, I just needed to tell you about whatever. This is a case where they've actually created a soundboard, and rather than pay someone $15 to get hung up upon, which is a very miserable thing for telemarketers to do, they realize they could pay someone you know, $5 an hour on the other side of the planet. doesn't matter that they have an accent. They'll sound perfectly Western. They'll stick to the script because they can only click on the different trees that go on there. And, uh, and I've said this before, but, uh, you know, I'll, I'll uh, you know, immediately shortcut to be like, hey, are you a robot? And they're like, ha do I really sound that bad? I'm like, great, that's awesome. I bet you're not a robot. Just do me a favor, say the word blue. And then they're like, they're like, oh, do I sound that bad? And they're like, B-L-U-E, just say that and we can have a great conversation. And then they, you know, they hang up. But like, those days are numbered, man. It, what, two years? You're going to be able to throw together a rudimentary algorithm that listens to me and, and has a conversation? Yeah, and I mean, what, who knows what's in the lab uh, at Google, let's say. You know, Ray Kurzweil, who, by the way, had made a bet with Mitch Kapoor, I think was one of the founders of Lotus Notes, about uh, a $20,000 bet. Kapoor said, you know, no computer would pass the Turing test by 2029. Wow. <laughs> We've been ahead of schedule. There, well, there'll be a debate about this because now it's gonna, it gets interesting because you'll have these things where it'll be like, yeah, but what we meant was, yeah, but we meant this. And it's because like the computer posed as like a 12 year old Ukrainian boy. And so, you know, already you're 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 in your head making allowances for somebody. But I make a lot of allowances for people having, you know, free will, but I'm not sure they do. <laughs> yeah, no, we could get that into that whole debate. If but, you believe in causality, then, you know, the oh, free will becomes an illusion. There's a great article in Wired I recommend everybody check out if you're interested in the subject, though, because the area in which computers are still not better at us is the game of Go. Oh, wow. You know, Go is a very, on the surface, a very simple game. You have black little stones and white stones, and the goal is to encircle your opponents. And it gets extremely complex. It's actually computationally far more complex than chess is. Chess, chess has, in the opening moves, a finite number of moves of a certain amount. Go has an even greater number than that. It gets complex. And your grandmasters, your, your, your masters of, of Go, talk about you reach a certain level, then after that, and you have what I would describe it as sort of a gestalt sense of the board, where it's really hard for you to describe what it is. And computers can't get past that. The masters of Go consistently beat the best chess programs, our best computing programs that are trying to do play the game of Go, which... You know, it's weird yeah. too, because uh, we keep moving the fence back, right? So it's mm -hmm. like, uh, when I was in high school, there were computers that could convincingly simul simulate, like if I were to play a game of Street Fighter 2, and in that little universe, with that timing and in that 90 second bout with the punches, kicks and jabs and movements or whatever, uh, I would say that there's a number of computer run artificial intelligence that could make me believe that a human was playing, you know, that uh, that, you know, and, and part of it would be, I mean, whatever, good enough. Right. And, and you could say like, well, you know, in a perfect situation, it would learn and adjust and et cetera, et cetera. And you're right. And now we're at that point. Same thing with uh, like chess, you know, chess can't, you know, chess bot can't think they're not smart. And then, you know, then deep blue happens. Now we're in a world where, you know, where, where the natural language capability of, of IBM's Watson is able to parse natural language questions. Uh, and I, I, I mean, it just feels like this is going to keep on moving forever, right? I mean, at, at, at some point, will we stop caring? Will we really have that her moment? I, you know, I think we're, I think we're very close to the her moment in a sense. Like, I think that, I think that given like what happened with this, you know, this Turing test, 
I think that you're we're very much at that point where you're going to have you could design because given how Eliza fools has been fooling people for over a decade, certain kinds of people. Okay. Now <laughs> it's going to get that much more complicated. And you know, imagine imagine something that follows Google News, and you start a conversation with like, oh, I saw this is interesting. Like, oh yeah, well I saw this thing come up over here where Senator So and So said that. Like, oh, I don't know much about Senator So and So, and they might know like, oh, well Andrew loves salacious gossip. Well, there was the thing where he did this, da 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 da, and I'm not getting a Wikipedia thing. Sure, I'm getting a well, conversation. And you're thing. even getting the nuanced conversation of you not you. It wouldn't just say here, look at this article. It would say the tease of like, well, you heard about the so and so, and then based yeah. on your response, you're like, no, was it? And then I can even see it saying like, hang on, let me find the article and wait, count off, you know. Uh, however many hundreds of milliseconds and before it pastes it in there and they're like check out that third paragraph where it says and whatever it, and if it knows what I know or, or if it knows what you know it does the same thing when I have a conversation with you I give short form to things you already know and they're like oh you know let me expand on that or you do the same thing for me did you hear about this and that's that's a very interesting sort of way to do that so I think that it's fascinating how where they go and here's the thing is I had this it was sort of interesting is that I, I, you know, people like feel like, ah, they're going to replace the sex. Some jobs are going to, if you're telemarketing, whatever, you're constantly at war with technology, you know, and a lot of information jobs are constantly at war, but the future is information jobs and how to manage these tools. One of the things that was kind of a significant thing that happened, you know, 20 years ago was the, the introduction of object oriented computer log programming was a big change in the sense that it used to be almost, you even have it up to that point, people like, I'm going to code in zeros and ones and sort of the assembler language and all that. But then you said, you know what, I can have a chunk of code that does a bunch of things. I don't need to know how it draws a circle or does this, whatever. I can just call it and make it happen. And AI is going to be more sophisticated, and we have that already. If you want to use voice recognition in an app, you can use a Google API and say, okay, whatever the person says in the microphone, figure out what they said and give me the words. Right. And then, and so essentially, essentially, if if you think of uh, each of these object-oriented modules as an analog to different parts of the body, this is finally just a, a brain module or a conversation module of, of of the interaction head of it. Yeah, you know, I watched an interview with uh, Matthew Reinhardt, who's designed a lot of the pop-up books I love, and he talks about how people often ask him, and and it, this was sort of intuitive to me. I thought it was interesting. People say, "What program do you use to make those?" And and I thought like you know that's 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 kind of tantamount to you know 500 years ago somebody shows me some amazing piece of sculpture I'm like well what kind of chisel did you use what did you do what 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 was the extension what was the, the intermediary between you and your art to help create this now his answer is he doesn't use one but the point is is we're so used to Photoshop we're so used to these things that which has very intelligent behaviors in there by the way to do these things you know you can. You can now use Photoshop to say, I need to copy this surface over here, and a computer behind the scenes does that. These things will be embedded into the tools, and we'll certainly be aware of the things we have conversations with, but the other ways these things assist us will continue to be invisible in a sense. Well, and there's, if you want to see where this is going, and this is, we're going to, this is apparently the hooray for Wired Hour, because the, one of the best articles, and I think we mentioned it before, is the better than human, why robots will and must take our jobs. And it basically boils down to, there's a, there's a, a line, I'm going to see if I can find it here, talking about how, there we go, existing jobs, new jobs, uh, current, so there's, there's jobs today that humans do, but machines will eventually do better. Uh, there's current jobs that humans can't do, but machines can. And then there's uh, new jobs coming that are jobs that only humans will be able to do at first. And then robot jobs that we can't even imagine yet, where robots yeah. are putting other robots to, to work. And all of this is only going to increase uh, the, the, the pie for everyone. I mean, yes, it will, mm -hmm. to anyone who's lost their job to a, a robot, I, I, my deepest condolences, I understand that'll be a pain in the ass. Uh, but... But for humanity as a whole, it's just getting better for all of us. The more of, of the work we don't feel like doing, the robots do. And I'm gonna and I'm gonna do like a little personal aside. Um, I I uh, I have friends who are ahead of the curve on stuff who are into these things and these technologies who do things like listen to podcasts and stuff and like what we're doing. And I have friends who do not. Friends who they, they went they did their four years in college and figured they were going to come out of college, the world was going to give them a high-paying job, and they were going to be set. 
and they found out that didn't work out that way. That the skills they had in college, you know, the one they paid way more for an education than it was actually worth. That they did not have the skill set beyond doing sales or other stuff like that. And my friends who move forward, my friends who do well, are my friends who are multi-skilled and who are always picking up new skills. They may not be the best at Photoshop, but they know how to use it. They may not be the best computer programmers, but they can pick up a book and they can say, I'm going to learn how to do this. The acquisition of skills is absolutely important. And you can sit there and say, I shouldn't have to. Then, yeah, you don't have to. But there's no rule that says that society has to carry you along. And there comes a point where we're carrying along too many people that we slow the overall progress down when if you have the joy of learning something new. And, and yeah, more I more actually... That, I actually, I, I feel like the pie is going to get so big that uh, that you'll have the option to either work or not work. A hundred years from now, I feel like you could either contribute to the virtual economy and, and there'll be like a baseline that everyone gets just for freezies. Uh, but it'll basically be Second Life. Second Life is a world well, where where there, there is no resource limitation and you, everyone gets the basic everything for free. But if you want to put forth the effort, you can get premium stuff. And I think we're kind of in that world, but that's when you get into, you know, the, you know, getting into like income disparities is a very sticky issue, and there's a very popular book out now that also just got torn apart by like the Wall Street Journal or Financial Times because the data seemed to be mucked with whatever. But people who have skills and work will outpace people who don't. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the first grave of people to go to Mars are going to be the people who are able to afford five hundred thousand dollars seats, round trip tickets to go there. The people who are trying to get by and just what they can do, fine. And I think, yeah, it's the, 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 pop, the lowest, the lowest, the, the poorest population has steadily increased as far as quality of life. You know, you're much better off being poor in 2014 than you were in 1914. 1914 and an American being poor literally meant borderline starvation. Yeah. You know, 2014 borderline poor, poor meant I maybe don't have HBO and I have to steal. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a very dramatic. I'm dramatic still on my parents' HBO Go accounts. Yeah. But my point, I guess my point is saying is that if you, you either, if you want to just ride along, that's fine. You're going to look at that. You're going to be envious of the people who are succeeding. But if you want to move forward, have skills, pick up stuff, pick up these things, be aware. You know, I mean, it's just, yeah, you know, well, here, why be a free rider? Here's the part of the article that I loved that I was trying to find the words for. He says there's uh, there's seven steps to dealing with robots taking over your job. Step one, a robot or computer can't possibly do what I do later. Step two, all right, it can do a lot of them, but it can't do everything I do later. Step three, all right, it can do everything I do, except it needs me when it breaks, which is a lot Ste later. Step four, all right, it operates flawlessly on routine stuff, but I need to train it for new tasks. Step five, all right, it can have my old boring job because it's obvious that was not a job that humans were meant to do. <laughs> Six. Wow, now that robots are doing my old job, my new job is much more fun and pays more. <laughs> Step seven, I'm so glad a robot or computer cannot possibly do what I do now. <laughs> I think that's it. I think that's the world yeah. we're headed to. And 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 uh, boring chit-chat, there's going to be a podcast bot that's able to do the kind of conversations that you and I are doing. Yeah. I, well, like on a side, like I have a friend whose father, uh, once he got retired from IBM, he could not find a job. Could not find a job. He spent 30 years at IBM as the typewriter repairman. I mean, and, and, I mean that's. And I mean, there, it, look, th th there are people. If you're somebody who that's really what floats your boat and you want to do it forever, it's it's a bummer that there's not any typewriters to repair. Although you could make uh, the argument that you know he now owns a very niche market and could charge a lot of money for. Well, there were a lot of other typewriter repairmen who went up at the same time he did. Okay, so, that's, but, a yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. And I guess my point was, but this was a guy that was not prepared for, you know, uh, what what happens next. Like my father, so my father spent 30 years in the ATF. And we're like, what's my dad going to do when he retires? Because all he knows how to do is like kick in doors and arrest people, you know. <laughs> what's he going to do? And my dad loved fly fishing. And my dad ended up being a guy who was a rep for fly rod companies. And then he evolved into when when the company he worked for got sold overseas, whatever, he knew so much about fly rods, he could go to fly fishing shops and they would give him his rods to sell on eBay. So now my dad has a thriving business on eBay, buying and selling fishing fly rods. Do, do, and my dad is, I was like, my dad's not a computer inclined person. My dad is not a computer. He is, he will go to Google to type in the name of a website to go to the website, right? Yeah. But he knows eBay, he knows how to do this stuff. And he's like, well, now we'll do this now. And he's a guy that mastered that little bit of technology and how to do that. Is wonderful. Do, do you think there's a fundamental change in in uh, the people nowadays where we have no expectation of doing one thing for the rest of our lives? In fact, if, if anyone's watching in the chat, 
uh, if, if you felt like you're going to do the same thing forever or not, let it, let us know there. I think it's it's fascinating. I think some people do. I think that's the problem. I think you have some people do. There's that weird entitlement sense, you know. And I think that you know, you and I were cut from similar cloth in the sense that being entertainers, being people who have always lived within you know whatever our capabilities were and, and knew that like we did not plan on oh, I'm going to get that 30 year job with the big company. We were like. I'm going to build my own thing. And it'll be good times. It'll be bad times. But overall, it'll even out for the better. Well, dear, but 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 think about it. You and I also have changed our careers to we were both full time touring stage magicians at one point, uh, and both of us, I, totally independent of each other, realized like, do I want to be 65 years old still doing this in this same circuit with these same people for the millionth time? And we both realized like, no, I need to be seeing what is something I would like to do that's peripherally related that that's scalable in the long term. And and both of us, and, <laughs> both and, of us decided to look into podcasting and then both of us looked into TV and, and, uh, and I mean, it's amazing how everything's changing. And, but I have, I have friends and you do too, that are entertainers have been doing the same thing for 20 years, 25 years. And they're realizing, Oh no, now what? And they don't have other skills. They don't have other skills. You know, the job they'll take after, after 25 years entertainment would be the job they could have gotten 25 years ago. Right. Well, and oftentimes, if if you don't have that idea of like what's next or what's down the road, then uh, you know a lot of folks the only skill they have is they have all their con contacts and they know the circuit, so they go into booking other people. Uh, so a lot of them go into to the agency side of things, which is fine. I think I think it's 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 a fine place. But yeah. uh, but I I knew for sure that wasn't what I was interested in doing, which is why. I mean, it took it took five six years to to it was it was a six year journey from scam school starting to me suddenly looking up and realizing, holy crap, I haven't done a college show in months. Yep, and I I just <laughs> I like you know it's like and as entertainers you're like ah we provide a very special form of entertainment. Grant and motion pictures everything else has been steadily eroding us and then oh yeah Tupac Michael Jackson they're dead doesn't matter <laughs> you know. <laughs> We can bring him back. By the way, the magician in the chat says he's been doing street magic for two years and stage for three. Uh, dude, that's great. You're actually just now ramping up to prime time. It takes a good three or four years to finally break in and start making decent money. You're, what you what I predict you'll see is three years from now, the magician, you'll be doing so good that you'll w wonder if you want to do anything else with the rest of your life, which I'm going to tell you is a pretty good time to start wondering what else you want to do with the rest of your life. <laughs> Or the alternate path is going to be like, hello, welcome to the Apple store. Um, here's my suggestion, the magician. Have a business plan. Have a business plan. If you already have a degree or in training in business, that's great. Go take some night school stuff, whatever. The guys who really get ahead and, and what Brian takes for granted, what Brian takes for granted is Brian has a very, very down-to-earth approach when he thinks about money, when he thinks about you know where is this going to lead, what's going to be the next thing. And that's rare among performers. I think that you have you have a much better idea of a business plan and how you progress on things. And you and you may say do you think you don't, Brian, but compared to other entertainers. No, you're you're right. And and I'll go ahead and see, you know, we uh we give picks and stuff. This is a side pick. Uh the whole reason that happened is uh I don't I don't think I've told this story here before. Um two years after I quit my day job, uh I, I had hired a agent to book me and he he booked me with the uh, the busiest fall I was ever going to have. And unfortunately, I had to pay him for the eight months leading up to that. And this is a time that I had absolutely no tangible assets. I had a car that was probably negative in value or whatever that, you know, living rent, you know, renting or whatever. And uh, I, I did the math and it just, you know, I had to pay my agent a monthly salary every month up until those gigs started coming in. And I watched my debt get to the pants crappingly high $60,000 mark all on credit cards. And I'm like, I don't, I don't have this. If I sold everything I have, what, what am I going to do? And I was like, all right, let's, let's look at the numbers. I, actually, I think it was closer to $50,000. Uh, oh. I said, let's look at the numbers. <laughs> let's look at the, cause I want to be accurate here. I said, let's look at the numbers. If I make it to all 45, 50 of these shows and I don't miss a single one and I don't have a mishap and I don't break my leg and I don't whatever, then let's see, ticket, 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 ticket. I could expect to get back to zero. And that was so utterly heartbreaking that I was going to have my best year by the numbers of earning. And the best it would do is, is get me back to zero. And, and so Bonnie 
suggested she's like well you need to learn how to uh, you know how to uh, how to deal with money so buy some financial books so i bought a bunch and what the one that stuck out was a book written in the early 1900s uh, called uh, The Richest Man in Babylon. That is a set of parables set in ancient Babylon. And what's great about it is because it takes place in anti ancient Babylon, they don't talk about dollars. They don't talk about money. They, they talk about gold coins. And this guy is the best charioteer in the whole land, but he can't understand why he could barely make his, his rent. And his friend is the best bard in the land, but he could barely make his rent. Meanwhile, their friend, who in school was dumber and slower and lazier than they were, is the richest man in Babylon, and they say, well, explain to us how. And uh, it, it, I highly recommend it. It, it was life-changing to me because the core principle of it was a part of everything you earn is yours to keep. And the response to that was, well, that's dumb. I thought everything I earned was mine to keep. And they're like, well, it's the end of the month. How, how much do you have? He's like, well, I had to give some for the rent. I had to give some for the fuel and for, uh, for school and all this stuff. And it's like, exactly. Part of what you earn is yours to keep. And the metaphor that stuck with me was the opening lesson. He said, what would happen if every morning you put 10 eggs in a basket and every evening you took nine eggs out? And uh, the response was like, well, by the end of the month, you'd be overflowing with eggs. And, uh, and the guy's like, exactly. And that, to me, was the core fundamental. So uh, to, to, to get back to your point, Andrew, uh, it's, been, it's been 14 years now. I, I know, yeah, I guess 14 years that I've been a, a very fastidious saver, uh, which, is, which has made it possible to make those shifts. And I'll, I'll tell you that, that, that book and the core idea there is a very important one. And that's one that when you start looking at like wealth gaps and, and that, and they go like, oh, the richest you know, is getting rich at this rate while the other part isn't. And it, it comes down to this. If you're building debt <laughs> or if you're investing, the investor will always outpace the person building debt. And you know we tend to think about investing meaning large amounts of money, but it's not. It's not. It can be even when I was you know when you know things were really really rough for me. I would I would still put twenty bucks away every month. I would always make that habit of doing that. And then when things were better, I would do more, or whatever, just to have that habit of doing that because you know I was fortunate in you know investing some things and you know companies like Apple early on and other places like that that was really able to you know make my life a little bit smoother than a lot of other people who have shiftless sort of careers like I have. But the end of the day is I guess is that that habit and it gets into short term gratification. But like, you know, every one of my friends I've ever had that conversation, like, yeah, if I had the money, they we're sitting in a bar and they have their second beer. You know, is there this and it's like it's there's the little well, things. And and that's the thing is is when you write a plan, you break it down into pieces small enough that you end up with an individual piece so small you can do it right now. You know, like like something right this minute. Like let's say part of your plan is to be uh, you know, a, f a famous whatever, and, and you realize that part of that plan is that you need to have written a book. And then, uh, well, in order to write that book, you need to uh, uh, brainstorm whatever. And it eventually gets to the point where you finally decide, well, here's something I could do right now. Let me open up Word and type in 25 different subjects that I'd like to write a book on. And, th and the difference is, is a lot of people don't don't ever take that, that one action step or whatever. I, and, and you know, I become much more efficient when I figured out how to maximize all of my time to do things I want to do. Like I'm writing, like I have notebooks all around me for book ideas. I have on my phone, I type in little ideas for stuff. I have like six books ahead mapped out for what I want to do. And, you know, I'm still, I'm still involved in TV. Tons of magic tricks played out, working on another television show project with my friends and always trying to do that stuff. And so, I maybe spend more amount of my time working on work than maybe I should, but I don't know how less I should. <laughs> well, look, I mean, uh, regardless, I mean, we don't want to change this into to, to the weird success podcast, but but I'll tell you what, in the interest of, of saving time on picks, that'll be my pick is the richest man in Babylon. All right. Good pick. My pick will be, uh, I played this game and um, I, I went to New York. I went for Book Expo America. I had a great time. That's why I wasn't able to do the podcast. Um, and yeah, I, had a, I had a wonderful time there. It was just just a neat, neat, neat experience. But whenever I go on a trip, that's my excuse to play games. I don't play games when I'm at home. I rarely do. I have like, I'll have like, maybe if I have friends over, I might play something to be social. But like, I just try to make my things I do for fun social. But when I go on a trip, I'm like, listen, I'm on an airplane. I can do whatever I want. And, um, I played the game Monument Valley. I don't know Monument Valley. What is that one? So Monument Valley is an iOS game, and it's on Android. It's by a gaming company called Us2. And that's another thing I want to point out, by the way, is that, uh, you know, if you're – there's so many awesome tools and things out there for people who, who are willing to learn how to use 
skills and things like that. I love the fact that some of the top video games now are two and three man development teams or woman teams, you know, and Monument Valley is basically a video game like for our handheld game. It's kind of like an MC Escher thing came to life. Okay. And so you have to figure out how to navigate through this landscape. And as Brian's looking at this video right now, you see this girl, you know, she's walking up steps, but then the steps sometimes go back down and then you have to avoid crow people. It's very simple kind of gameplay, but it's based upon these sort of optical illusions and that you may not see a path until you look at it from a different direction. Oh, this is great. This, uh, you know what this reminds me of is there's a uh, experimental project called, uh, I want to say scale that um, uh, instead of like a gravity gun, you would walk up close to an object so it looked really big to you, and then you would click on it, and then uh, and it would fuse that object into being really big so you could move it and set it somewhere else. Uh, this, this seems like very much in the same vein. Yeah, and you know, one great example I heard somebody says is, you know, like every, you know, every frame could be a poster, and it's absolutely true. You can actually take snapshots from the game. And so I'm looking at, uh, you know the team for the team that made this was one two three four five six seven like eight eight people you know an eight person team spent ten months to create I think is one of them and you take a game like threes which is even more simpler which is just captivating yeah by and, the way uh, I've gotten on my high horse now every time someone mentions twenty forty eight I'm like please consider uh, playing uh, threes the game that twenty forty eight is a shameless ripoff of. Yeah. Yeah, that's funny because, like, yeah, I remember there was like the talk about ah, twenty forty eight is wonderful and visual, and someone's like, hey, listen, you got to go look at threes. That's the original. And that that whole, yeah, like threes is like I've had, I've taken that off. I allowed myself to play through. I mean, literally, <laughs> I'm like a guy with a heroin addiction. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna go out of town. I can do a little threes when I'm there. But as come long home, as it's there, man, that's just my New York thing. I don't, I I don't home, play threes I'm in L.A. I'm playing no more threes, and so like I got, I have to kind of check to see if I deleted threes when I got home. Um, I did. I deleted <laughs> threes when I got you. back. <laughs> I absolutely did, uh, and so that's the thing. And Monument Valley, I like because it's it's there's a beginning, middle, and end. There's a storyline to it. It is. Uh, I just loved it. I loved it. Like uh, again, I'm I'm a all right. Much this is more... one. This is one that I know that I'll love and that my daughter will love. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pick it up right away. Uh, I, I do want to say real quick. I've been playing on the live streams and I'm almost done with it. But uh, the uh, Wolfenstein, the New Order, is. Right. So it's got this uncanny valley. I'm unfairly hard on this game because the story is fantastic. The cinematics are great. The set pieces are unfathomably amazing to watch. Uh, it, it starts off like every other um, uh, World War II uh, game, only it's a bit over the top in that you see giant mechs walking and so on. Uh, but then... <laughs> but then you take shrapnel in your head, you're, you're blown out for 15 years as you sit there and watch the world flash in front of you like a stop motion photography. And then finally you come to in 1960s and, uh, and the Nazis have taken over everything. And then boom, opening credits, right? Um, because I love the game so much, I am having an agonizingly tough time with, with a few minor flaws uh, in the game level, de level design. There's probably been like four times when I wasted 30 minutes because uh, because the level looked to me like it wanted me to solve it a certain way. But then secretly I was like, oh, you mean I had to do that the whole time? Or I thought you told me I needed to do this, you know? And just those moments take so much out of me that it, it keeps me from, you know, calling it like a game of the year by any stretch. But I will say it may be the, the story, the game story of the year for me. Wow, wow. I don't have quite the breadth of knowledge of games you do, sir. That's okay. Just say, I believe you. <laughs> I believe you. I believe you. You are a person that can control these demons far better than I can. Um, or at least channel them. <laughs> yeah, learn channel them. Learn to live stream them. <laughs> Everybody watch me play video games. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, uh, so that's good. And, uh, and I guess Everybody next... Everybody watch me write. <laughs> you just got to do snarky commentary about your own writing as it happens. Ah. <laughs> uh, Brian? Yeah, man. It's been weird. That was good. That was tight. That was tight-ish. <laughs> <laughs> I ended with you saying tight-ish. <laughs> All right, save, copy, as. Hey, uh, do we need to send a note to uh, Cheeto to make sure that this gets posted since usually Justin handles all that? Um, yeah. All right. What are we calling this? Let's call this, uh, let me see, what are we talking about here? Let me pull up my list. Um, 
Did you see any ghost uh, monkeys? Did I see what? Some, uh, <laughs> any monkeys on your ghost trip at the zoo? Oh, they, no, there were, there were. Oh, it was funny. So there was a, uh, at a, uh, there's a place, there's a, there's one section, a very dark group of woods where, uh, um, I'm trying to think of a title to it at the same time. I can't multitask. All right, well, hey, let's, let's, let's do the title real quick so I can start saving okay. it. Um, uh, Captain Musk's Magic Carpet Ride. There you go. Captain Musk's. Uh, can you do an apostrophe? I don't think I can. Captain's Musk. Uh, uh, Captain Musk's, yeah. Let's was, was call him Captain Musk. And his Magic Carpet Ride. Or Magic Captain Musk and his sweet, sweet ride. <laughs> magic Captain Musk and his sweet, sweet ride. Done. Um, so they had a section, this really cool dark area, and you had Mothman. Okay. They were there, yep. as one does. As, yeah, I was about to say, as, then, as you find often places. And then you get people who will hide behind the trees waiting in costume to pop out at you. And I go over there and there's like this thing where I'm trying to dig around like a nest to try to find some sort of prize or tool. Did, or what, did, they, or did they get any like really good scares? I, I can't believe I forgot to ask you that. That's the most important thing. Did they get you good? No. Uh, I'm hard. I know. I know. I'm you're, very hard. You're looking around I'm, corners I'm and you're predicting everything. You, you can't take yourself out of the writer's mode. Well, of, no, but also like I'm sometimes a non-reactor. Yeah, I mean, I'll go walking. I'll go on my walk at night, and I'll have my headphones in, and all of a sudden a bike will come by me, and I'm like, I'm like, yeah, you know, I'll do that, <laughs> you know, because I'm just totally my own zone and out of it. But sometimes you'll be like, you'll be like, bah! and I'll be like, like all inside, right. I'm like, holy crap, you know. But I'm like so slow. The reflexes are like, I get home, I'm like, ah. But uh, I'm not. But like, I go over there. And I go, like, I'm leaning down this nest, and I look over there. There's this big, huge tree, and I see this massive foot sticking out from behind it. And I start cracking up. I'm like, nobody realized this is the problem with Bigfoot. He's got two goddamn big feet for him to hide. Oh, that's and hilarious. Wait, Melanie, go look at that. She's like, well, I go look, and you see these feet sticking out there. Then you get the Bigfoot's going to like, He's like, please don't, don't let me scare you. Yeah, I'm like, sorry, dude, but the feet were sticking out. I just started cracking up because I just see this giant foot. I'm like, I wonder what's behind there. That's hilarious. Uh, they had a lot right. of like, weird, like they had like these goat dudes, like with goat legs that like were the dumpsters. Like you had to climb into dumpsters to get stuff and they'd trap you and you had to bargain with them. Oh, wait. Oh, so you had to give up. It was like losing a life or something. You had to give yeah, up your, your yeah, stuff. Yeah, I, I gave up a, a skull for a condom. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, okay, let me do. Uh, hey, man, you uh, are you still watching Game of Thrones? Nah, I just gave up on it. It's like, really? I mean, it's like, I mean, how far, how, far, how far did you get? Are you kidding me? Well, because because you give up on Game of Thrones. Well, but the thing is, I know you did give up on the books, and and I didn't know because I knew that how excited you were about the show, but I also know you've given up on stuff later. So yeah, I didn't I know if this the was the case because the show is so goddamn awesome. Well, yeah, no, I I agree with you. That's uh, justified like, hey, and hundred hey, percent right. Hey, Brian, do you want to read Star Wars Seven, the the working shooting script, or do you want to watch the goddamn movie? Oh no, I want to watch the movie. Want to watch the movie? Yeah, yeah. and like I I I mean, I told you, I stopped I stopped listening to the audiobooks. When I heard cat, when I heard rumors they were making it into a TV show, and I heard Peter Dinklage was attached. Oh, really? Just based on yeah. that? And you I were was like, in my That's amazing. Office. I'm my agent's office, and there are two writers. They're over there talking about it. Bruce is like, "Oh yeah, yeah, we got Dinklage attached to this." And I'm like, <gasps> and I'm like with Mary, and she said, "I'm like, oh my god, stop! I'm like, I gotta pretend to listen to this." <laughs> That's amazing. And I'm like, listen to them talk about Game of Thrones, be going. I'm like, they're making it into a movie. It's our TV show. And so I'm like, holy crap. And I'm like, Dinklage is tearing. I'm like, oh my God. And I'm like, I'm waiting for this. Yeah. Well, uh, well, good, 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 good. Because uh, I just want to make sure we're on the same page. Dude, uh, this season has been, for my killing opinion, it. killing it. it. I've, there's not, and there's been seasons like, there's never been a bad episode of Game of Thrones. There's been episodes of Game of Thrones where you're like, man, those other ones are great. This was okay. Right. They weren't to that standard. But this is, they've been, yeah, they've just been, they've been killing it. And like, here's my advantage. Like, can we get into spoiler territory here? Yeah. All right. Let's, uh, uh, here, I'm going to start uploading this right now. So, okay. Uh, officially, 
We're going to talk some spoilers. You don't have to worry about book spoilers because uh, Andrew will kill me if I tell him any book spoilers. Do you know any yeah. of the book spoilers? No. Okay, no, good. No, no, I'll, I'll be careful I'm, then. I'm very pure about that. So, so here's the thing. Here's the advantage of not knowing what's coming. Okay, Brian? Yeah. So last season, I'm watching this wedding – Right. Oh, so you had you had the uh, the 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 perfect experience. Okay. I'm watching the wedding, and then I'm like, man, this music. It's a little weird music. It's getting a little tense. I'm like, I wonder if somebody's gonna say something mean. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and like, yeah. and like, I'm a guy that likes to. Like, again, I'm a guy that I can't help but think where things are going on this show. I don't know where things are going, and then all of a sudden, I'm like, oh no. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! You know, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, all right. And so, you know, this last episode, I'm like, um, I'm like, wow, Martell is like, hey, he's like, oh, I'm a little worried. Is he gonna do it? I'm like, Martell's doing it. He's killing it. I'm like, he's doing a little bit of a victory dance there. Oh, yeah. he's, still, he's, he's kind of dancing the end zone a little bit too much there. I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable by this. And then it's like. Oh shit! <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and plus, also, even having read the book and and having a pretty good idea of what the outcome was going to be, uh, they have a knack for 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 just hitting a level of of graphic uh, uh, punchiness that it was like I mean I knew what was coming and it still like was just like Dah! I couldn't believe it. It was amazing. And I'm like I'm like when his people like I'm in like constant denial on stuff. So like when his eyes are getting crushed in, I'm like he could he could pull through. He could pull through. Then the thumbs go with like I don't think he's gonna pull through at this point. And then it's you're like oh yeah. you're like yeah it's not it's not it's not coming it's not coming. So yeah, that was, uh, yeah. I I um, I love. It's my. I think it's. And again, if I say this is my favorite show, I think it's the best show ever on TV. It doesn't take away anything from like Breaking Bad or anything else. My pin is best show on television ever. Uh, I I would say that's accurate. I would say. Um, I mean, there are brief moments where my enthusiasm for other shows have reached heights as high or even higher than some episodes, but. Uh, uh, you know, like for example, the the first season of Battlestar Galactica, I think, was was mm -hmm. the best science fiction that's ever been on television. Uh, I, but then, I w I'm with you on that. But then the second season, they were all like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! Let's slow things down around here. We got to stretch this out." But uh, yeah, I would agree. I, I think it is the best show on television. Yeah, I and again, that's not to say like, ah, oh, you're somebody else likes it. The wrong. Like, just personally speaking, like I think I still haven't seen the last two seasons of Breaking Bad. I'm, I'm like saving myself. That's cool. I mean, they're good. They're good. But uh, I mean, I love, 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 love that show. And that was a show that at first I had a problem with because you know the anti-hero kind of the, the way that you know the idea of the direction. But once I understood what Vince Gilligan was doing, I'm like, oh, I get it. I like this. This is cool. This is smarter than I can than, than I would think. Yeah, smarter than me. Um, but yeah, like Game of Thrones. Like yeah, I'm like, here's the thing that sucks. So I feel sorry for every show that they put on after, like when Game of Thrones does its run for its season, because then it's like, I'm sorry. Not Game of Thrones. Yeah. Don't care. <laughs> yeah. And, and poor Lindelof, you know, is doing the leftovers, and it's like, and and I I hate kind of magical realism with a passion. So there's art. When you say wait, the leftovers, what what is that? That's the new HBO series coming on about like two percent of the population vanishes under what may be rapture like events, but some people were good, some people were bad, and they don't know what it is. So that's the next. That's the got next it. That's part. right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And and and, and it takes a lot. Like I I was. You know, I'm like, ah, True Detective, really? And then, like, and I will argue, like, True Detective is the most game changing thing in television ever. It's way good, way, way good. So, uh, uh, but all right. Well, look, I'm I'm gonna shut down the feed because I gotta set up some stuff. Uh, also, gonna watch Game of Thrones. Also, have to record uh, uh, Domain.com ad um, and some other stuff too. Uh, all right, look, man, good talk, good times. Uh, yeah. The 